this episode is a little bit different. This is going to be a vlog style video of me building a PC, specifically a home lab server that I'm going to be building. We talked about it on the podcast last week that I wanted to get back into home labbing again. And I wanted to set something new up. My home lab that I used to have was actually taken over by my son, now his gaming PC. So I don't have a home lab anymore. I'm beginning the project today of replacing that. And instead of just doing the work and then talking about it on the podcast, I decided to make a video where I record the entire build. We'll do it in episodes. This could turn into a series. I'll document the process all the way through and hopefully it's interesting for people to watch. You can also tune into the podcast, Crowbar Colonel Panic, where we're gonna discuss in greater detail the decisions that I've made and that Josh has made with his home lab. And we'll discuss more philosophies around home lab and home servers. And in this first episode, it is the PC build and the Proxmox installation. So why am I doing this in the first place? Why even build a home lab? So my number one, absolute number one reason for wanting to build a new home lab is because I'm jealous of Josh's awesome home lab. He has a high availability, small PC a cluster, and I think it's just sick and I want one. My number two reason is the more serious one. My number two reason, my philosophy in working in this industry is that we have to continuously be learning. I couldn't tell you how many times I have worked with people that have gotten comfortable in a specific technology, and then they want to make that the solution to every problem because it's the one they're comfortable with. I don't want for every problem to be a nail because I'm a hammer. And as new technologies come out, I want a place where I can play with them. Having a home lab gives me the ability to try things out like running Docker containers on a Kubernetes cluster. Even if it is that my container is just running Plex or Jellyfin or something that seems unimportant, it's an opportunity for me to try these technologies out and to continuously learn and to have a playground to do that. So first up, we need to talk about the hardware and why I chose this hardware. So what I'm building here today is a generation or two old gaming PC, but without the graphics card. There is a lot of crossover in that Venn diagram of gaming PC versus home lab PC. So much so that I think that you can take that approach. So let's just review the parts that I've chosen. Why don't we do it in order of my favorite purchases? So my number one, my favorite purchase, because there's good and there's bad, right? Like I bought some things that I was really happy with. And then I bought a few things just because they needed to fit in the budget. And in reality, I wish that I had put a little more money with it and got something a little bit better. Why don't I start with the good purchases first? My favorite purchase out of this entire build is the case. The case I went with is a Lee & Lee A3 Micro ATX. This is a very small form factor PC. It doesn't eat up space. It's very quiet. The fans are all covered in mesh. It is a very handsome <laughs> piece of hardware. It'll look good in your office. Very stylish design. It has a lot of room for upgrades. I was really impressed. I thought getting a micro ATX case, I've never done a micro ATX build before. And so I was a little nervous about what all was gonna fit in this case, but there is plenty of room. I have a oversized CPU cooler, which is also a great purchase. I got the Noctua CPU cooler, which is a classic. Everybody knows that cooler. It fits in there great. I was a little nervous that it would be too big, but not at all, it fits great. Also, it's Lee and Lee, which is a brand that I have loved for years. I've always been a fan of Lee and Lee. The second purchase that I bought that is right up there with the case, maybe I think the case and the CPU are tied. They're both great, great purchases for a really good price. The Ryzen 7 5800 XT is a great AM4 CPU. I think it is the best AM4 CPU. If I were going to get anything better than this, I would go AM5 instead of AM4 which would significantly increase the cost of this build and may make it outside the budget of what I want to spend on my first home lab. It's an eight core, 16 threads, which is plenty of horsepower for virtualization. AM4 platform is mature, stable, affordable right now. This isn't necessarily a gaming chip. This is about cores, thread, and stability. There's no integrated graphics, which is an interesting point I didn't think about whenever I ordered the CPU. It's not necessary for a home lab. Obviously we're gonna run the home labs headless and connect to it. So we don't need integrated graphics. 
except for the initial installation. So we'll get into that later in the video when we do our first boot. That's just something to keep in mind whenever you order your CPU. It's not necessary, but you may want to have a spare GPU up in the top of your closet or somewhere to boot up for the first time and do that Proxmox installation. RAM, decent purchase, pretty happy with it. I got 64 gigs. It's a two 32 gigabyte sticks, which keeps two slots free if I ever want to upgrade, which in reality, I found two more DDR4 sticks of RAM in my closet. I haven't looked at them close enough to see if they're going to work with this motherboard, but it could be that I'm upgrading this pretty rapidly. But for the sake of this video, we're starting out with 64 gigs, which is the sweet spot for a home lab. It lets me run lots of VMs and containers without hitting any memory limits. DDR4 is way cheaper than DDR5, which is part of the reason we went with the AM4 versus the AM5 build. It keeps us under budget. And memory is where you fill the pinch in a home lab. Uh, so you want plenty of headroom. I think that if this is where you don't want to skimp. Even if you're building a home lab from spare parts in your closet, you want to make sure that you have 32 or 64 gigs of RAM. That could be something you want to upgrade, even if you are using spare parts. Okay, so those are all the good purchases. Storage was a good purchase. So I bought a one terabyte NVMe SSD. It's a fast 4.0 NVMe, which is perfect for Proxmox and for VM disks. The reason why I'm on the fence about this purchase is because really I need something for data storage. This is gonna be great for Proxmox and for VMs, but I am going to have to build an external drive at some point in the future to house any sort of media like photos, videos, etc. But this will be great to run Proxmox itself and to be the local drive for the Proxmox box. All right, let's get into the bad. My final two purchases are definitely the one I wish that I had spent a little more money and got something a little bit better. The motherboard. I got a B550M, I don't know how to say this, Oros Elite AX. This is a micro ATX, so it fits inside the case. It is compact. It's still pretty expandable. It has two M2 slots, PCIe 4 slot. So it is future flexibility. I can add more NVMe drives if I need to. I can use that PCIe slot to do some sort of expansion. I don't have plans for it yet, but I know that we are. There's a few options and we have to decide what to do with it. It's a good balance of con consumer features with just enough expansion, but that's just it. It's just enough. I feel like I wish I had bought a, a MSI or an Asus. I wish I had bought something that had a little bit more features in the BIOS, had a little bit more features on the board. The power supply is probably the cheapest thing I bought for the build, but it is probably the place that I cheaped out the most. Essentially, I went to Amazon, I went to the power supply section, and I sorted by lowest price to highest. And I picked the first brand that I recognized which was an MSI 550 bronze edition. So this is, it's gonna be plenty enough to run our build. It's gonna be efficient to run 24 seven, which is what you want in a home lab. I just don't know that it's gonna have the longevity that a nicer power supply would. And it could be one of the first things that we have to replace at some point. I don't know if a year from now, I'll be using the same power supply. We'll see, we'll see how long it lasts. It is MSI, which is a brand I like, but. It must be the cheapest power supply MSI has ever made. And also, I don't know that people really think of MSI as like the great power supply brand. So now we're at actually assembling the PC, which in all honesty, pretty straightforward. At this point, you're just building a PC, which I'm sure that everybody watching this video has done at least once or twice in their life. Essentially, building a PC is like putting together Legos. If the pieces fit, they were meant to go together. If they don't fit, they weren't meant to go together and you can't make it fit. So don't force anything. And you'll be all right. That's a golden rule to any kind of PC building is just don't force it and it'll work out. We'll montage through this real quick and get to the part where we're doing the first boot, which introduces my first problem. first thing I discovered whenever I started the computer for the first time was that 
There is no GPU in this build. There is no graphics chipset on the motherboard. There's no graphics chipset in the CPU, and there's no graphics card in this build. Now, it doesn't matter for a home lab because we're going to be running this headless. We're going to connect to it over our local network, and so it's not necessary for the running of Proxmox. However, it is necessary for booting the computer and installing Proxmox. So here is where I ran into an issue. So what I did to resolve this was I grabbed the GPU out of my son's gaming PC. Hey. Here goes nothing. So I have the Proxmox ISO uh, burned to a thumb drive. Thumb drive's in the server and uh, soon to be home server. Let's see. Um, let's see if it's just as easy as clicking any key. All right, here we go. Install Proxmox Graphical. I have two keyboards and two mice on my desk. Remember which one is the appropriate one to, to click and, and hit. All right, so we have to choose what drive, the target hard drive that we want to install Proxmox onto. Uh, there's only one option in this case. Um, that is that one terabyte NVMe drive that we set up. We'll use that for, I'm planning to use that for all of the local to Proxmox storage. In, a, in the future, I'll hook up uh, external drives of some sort. That'll be a later video, but for now, uh, one terabyte ought to be enough for the VMs and for um, you know, anything that Proxmox needs locally. So all of this, this point is just like any other Linux installation. Actually, I don't know how hard it'll be to change this in the future. So I better go ahead and put something a little more complicated now. All right, so these settings here are a little more important. First off, we have the uh, management interface. This will be uh, the network adapter that we want Proxmox to use. Um, and of course, we're going to use the wired connection. And right now, um, this only has one just standard, you know, the Ethernet that came on the motherboard. We will be upgrading that in the future, but that'll be in a later video. Um, for now, we're just going to use the default one. Um, also, we have to decide on a host name, fully qualified domain name that represents our Proxmox network. So it's only internal to us. We can basically name it whatever we want. The IP address that it has right now is what was given to it by the DHCP of my router. Uh, now this is important. I want this IP address to always be the address that represents my Proxmox management portal. So what I'm going to do after recording this video is I've made note of that IP address. I'm going to log into my router and I'm actually going to set it to always assign that IP address to this Mac address for this hardware. Um, and it's just an internal 192.168. Just in, it's an internal uh, network range to uh, my router. DNS server. So this is, it gathered this DNS server detail from my home router. I'm going to be changing this in the future. We'll be using uh, a different DNS. We're going to be hosting our own and then, and then we're going to forward to a public one after that. So I'm definitely going to be changing this setting in the future, but for now, we're just going to go with the default uh, because it will work right out the gate. Okay. So for the fully qualified domain name, I have decided on, we're going to call it PVE one. Dot home lab. Dot land. Man, that seems almost way too easy. That's it. Proxmox is installing. So the beauty here is it's really fast. Um, it only takes a few minutes and then essentially it'll reboot and then we'll be in our first uh, boot of Proxmox and we can see what the web UI looks like.
Okay, so it came up. So we can log in here with uh, root and then the password. And then we have just a regular, you know, just a plain Linux terminal. We're logged in as hardcore. We're hardcore root right now, so we want to be careful doing anything. But we don't actually want to do that. We want to log into the uh, web interface and show what that looks like. Um, but first, now that I've gotten this far, I need to stop here and put my son's computer back together so he can play Minecraft. So let me get off to do that. Okay, I think we're going to end the video here. We have Proxmox installed. So in the next video, we will be going over creating VMs and creating templates and using those templates to build a Kubernetes cluster. And then that will probably be the second video will be all about the Kubernetes setup. And then we'll continue on after that. And I hope that this will be a continuing series that is a companion to the podcast. Please stay tuned for more videos like this. Please continue to listen to the podcast. We appreciate everyone that listens every week. Thanks for watching.